All right, let me go ahead and make sure things working fine on my end. I can, I can see the chat. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So um, last time, I believe this is where we stopped. Um, guys, in this class last time, did we get to the graphs? Did we, did we, did we, did we get the graph, um, Angela and Blake's position here? Or were we at the moment where we were calculating the slopes? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so um, I want to remind you guys and um, that over the course of the next few days, we're going to be talking a lot about graphing motion. Understand how to interpret position time graphs, velocity time graphs, and acceleration time graphs. Understand how to, Understanding how to interpret those things are very, very important in physics. So we're going to spend a few days working on those, um, um, those topics. Um, and remember, I also posted a video, an air puzzle video for you guys to watch last time that basically gave you an introduction to position versus time graphs. Okay, so what we have right here, um, we have Angela and Blake, they're running towards each other. And obviously, they're running in opposite directions because one is moving this way, is one is moving this way, and eventually they are going to meet. Um, as they are running towards each other, um, we created a table of um, their positions at various moments in time, and we plotted those out on our position versus time graph here. Um, and I want you guys to notice some trends. Notice that um, Angela is moving in the positive direction, therefore she has a positive slope to her velocity. And Blake is moving in the negative direction, therefore he has a negative slope to his velocity. Also, Angela is moving faster than Blake, so her slope is steeper compared to Blake's slope. Um, for those of you guys that are just now coming in, I want to let you all know that the session is being recorded. So just give you a heads up, we are recording this session for today. You are being recorded, so just keep that in mind. Now, the next step right here, we want to um, calculate the slope of the line by choosing two points from the line. Um, now, guys, remember, remember what I said last time. Whenever you're calculating the slope of a best fit line in physics, the College Board does not want you to choose points from your data table. Um, rather, they want you to choose any two random points that you want as long as they, they do not, um, uh, I'm sorry, as long as they do touch the line. So as long as they touch the line, um, and they're random points. You can choose any points you want um, um, in order to calculate the slope. And if we have time by the end of the day, I'm going to elaborate in detail why why that is the case. Why you, um, um, you have to choose two random points to touch the line that is not necessarily taken from your data table. Okay, so I'm going to choose the two points that they chose. Um, and the two points that they chose... Um, and again, you can choose whatever random points you want to calculate the slope. The points that they chose, they chose, um, for, the, for the first point, they chose an x value of 0. 0.6, right? So this is 0. 0.2, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.6. Uh, and they chose, a, so at that point, the y value uh, is equal to 3. Okay, so this is 0. 0.1 that they chose, and then for point two, they chose an x value of 2.4, right, because this is 2.2, 2.4, and you read that all the way off to three, so 2.4, and at that point right there, again, we're touching the line, so the y value at that point is 12, okay, let me zoom in here so you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, so once again, we're going to label this. We're going to label this point one, and this is point two, right? Because we always read our graph from left to right, so point one and point two. Now, um, let us read off the x value and the y value. So we just see that this x value here is equal to point six, right? Because this is point eight, and then one second. So that value is uh, zero point six for the x value here, 
And if you notice, you can easily see that the y value there for that point is 3, um, right? Because this is 4, this is 3. So, so that's my, um, I don't know if y'all can tell, that's a 0 there, 0 0.6. So, um, so that's my x1, y1. Let us choose our x2, y2. So here, this x value here is at 2.4 for my x value. And my y value here, if you notice, for this point, this y value here is 12. Okay. So now that we have our two points, let us plug those numbers into our equation for slope. And everybody should know slope is equal to rise over run. In other words, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So remember, y2 had a y value at 12 meters. We just saw that from above. Um, um, y1 had a value at 3 meters. Okay. And for this y point right here, our x value was 2.4 seconds. Okay. And then here, for this y value right here, our x value was 0.6 seconds. Okay. Hopefully you guys are all following me and writing along with me. So this is just simple math here. So 12 minus 3 gives us 9. And 2.4 minus 0.6 gives us 1.8. Okay. And if you do your computations, 9 divided by 1.8 gives you 5 meters per second, right? That's our unit, rise over run. In other words, meters per second. So the slope there is indicative of our object's velocity. Okay. And if you notice, and notice the guys, five meters per second, if you go up, that's exactly what we were told at the beginning of the worksheet, that that's how fast Angelo is running. Angelo is running at five meters per second. So here's the point, guys, here. I want you guys to see something here, that if you take any two points, any two random points along this line, any two random points, and plug it into your equation for slope, you're going to always get the value of the object's velocity, okay, assuming this is a position time graph. So the slope will always represent the magnitude of the object's velocity. So, and again, guys, you can pick any two random points. I could have chose this point right here, or I could have chose that point right there. As long as it touches the line, it is going to give you the object's velocity. And again, as a habit, the College Board wants you to choose points that are not necessarily shown on your table. It's because remember, in the real world, uh, um, in, the, in the real world, there could be error on your table. Well, th there could be error within the data from the table, and so the College Board wants you to avoid that to avoid that error, and only focuses on and only focus on the best fit line. Okay, now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of speed this up because I think you guys get the basic point how to calculate slope. Um, now we just have to calculate Blake's slope. And by the way, um, if you do your slope correctly for Blake, you should definitely get a negative velocity because this slope is going downhill, so it's a negative slope, right? Because um, if you choose two points as you reach your graph from left to right, for example, this will be point 0.1, and then this will be point 0.2 as you reach your graph from left to right. So keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, but I'm not going to choose those two points. I'm going to choose the two points that they chose on their answer key because remember, the points cannot come from your data table. Um, I'm not going to worry about labeling anything. I'm just going to go ahead and just, because um, you guys can go back and label these points on your own. Uh, but just know for Blake, for Y2, uh, they, they chose a value of 7 meters. And at 7 meters, the X value there at that point was 2.6 seconds. Okay. For um, Y1, they, they chose 11 meters for their point, and the X value at that point gave me a value of 1.3 seconds. Okay. So, um, 7 minus 11 gives me negative 4. 
and then 2.6 minus 1.3 gives me 1.3. Ah, we have a negative number there, so clearly we're looking at a negative slope. Negative 4 um, divided by 1.3 gives me negative 3 meters per second for the magnitude of my velocity. So the slope for Blake comes out to be 3 meters per second. Basically, that's the slope here for this blue line. Okay. Guys, go ahead and get that written down before I change the page, before I shift to the next page. Okay, y'all got that? Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's move on to part D. Part D says, based on the slopes you calculated in parts B and, ski, B and C, sketch a velocity time graph for Angela and Blake. Uh, make each graph a different color. Okay, so um, now we're introducing what is known as velocity versus time graphs. Here we have a position versus time graph. So we, we want to convert what's on this position versus time graph to a velocity versus time graph. Well, we clearly see Angela's moving at a constant velocity, and her slope here is 5 meters per second. So if we go, if we go to our velocity versus time graph, in order to represent Angela's velocity, we must do this here. So Angela's velocity, so we're going to go up here to a, to a value of 5 meters per second, and we're going to draw a straight horizontal line through that point because that right there, that is the magnitude of Angela's velocity is five meters per second. And again, her velocity stays constant. So that means the velocity should stay the same. It should stay at five as to as time progresses into the future. Okay, the same thing with Blake. Um, uh, remember, Blake's velocity was negative three meters per second. So what I need to do here in order to represent Blake's velocity, I need to go here. Um, now I'm on the negative end of the graph. So I need to go to negative 3. I need to draw a straight line through negative 3. Okay. And this right here indicates that Blake's velocity stays constant at negative 3 meters per second. And it's a negative because he's moving in the opposite direction. Okay. So everybody got that? So all I did was I've, I've just I've taken this position versus time graph here, and I duplicated the data on a velocity versus time graph. And guys, you can clearly see the difference. On a position time graph, we have a nice um, straight sloping line, but on a velocity time graph, in order to represent a constant velocity, the line has to be horizontal. Okay. So any questions on that? No. All right, let us keep going. Okay. So if you look at part E, part E says, Carlos makes the following claim about the intersection of the two lines on the position versus time graph in part A. Okay, so guys, in this position versus time graph right here, this student named Carlos, he's looking at this graph and he's going to make a claim about this data here. This is what Carlos says. Carlos says the point on the position versus time graph where the two lines cross represents the time when Angela and Blake are at the same position and traveling at the same velocity. Okay, guys, if you read this statement, there's something that Carlos said was correct in his statement. However, there was something that he said that was wrong. So he had one thing right and he had one thing wrong. Someone tell me, by looking at this position versus time graph, what is it that he said was right and what is it that he said that was wrong? Anyone? Should I read his statement again? Carlos, yes. yeah. yeah, Carlos says, the point on the position versus time graph where the two lines cross represents the time when Angela and Blake are at the same position and traveling at the same velocity. He's referring to this graph up here. What do you guys think is right and wrong about his statement? 
can't be wrong about the velocity, but right about the same position. Bingo! You're exactly right, Amaya. He's um he's right in saying that that at this intersection point, guys, on a position versus time graph, anytime you see an intersection point right here, um, that intersection point basically means that the objects are at the same place at the same time. And that would kind of make sense, right? If two objects are running towards each other, they're going to eventually cross each other's paths and eventually just, you know, keep going their direction. So it's going to be like this. So at that point, they have the same position value at the same time. Um, so he's right about that. So there, their position values are equivalent. However, he is wrong about their velocities. Remember, the magnitude of their slopes were different. So as long as the magnitude of the slopes were different, they had different velocities. One was moving at 5 meters per second. The other was moving at 3 meters per second. Okay. So with everything that we just see it, um, let us fill in our claim below. Um, because our claims should basically correct Carlos' claims. So I'm going to fill this in. Let me make this big enough so I can write on it. Okay. So, so and again, I'm just filling in what they have. Um, so, so this is what we're saying. We agree that the position... It's the same because Angela and Blake do have the same position of 9.5 meters at 1.9 seconds. Okay. However, we do not agree that they have the same velocity. So we got, because the slope of one line is 5 meters per second and the slope of the other line is negative 3 meters per second. Okay, so y'all got that? So I'm going to let you guys write that down. So reading off our claim again, so we agree that the position is the same because Angela and Blake do have the same position of 9.5 meters at 1.9 seconds. However, we do not agree that they have the same velocity because the slope of one line is 5 meters per second. And the slope of the other line is negative 3 meters per second. Remember, on a position time graph, slope is always indicative of velocity. Okay. Hmm. Everyone got that? Can I move on? Yes. All right. Okay, now, moving on to the second, no, the third worksheet that I posted in school, G, last class period. Um, and again, these are worksheets that are taken from the from the College Board's workbook. Again, the College Board, they are the people who make the AP exam. So this workbook came directly from them. Okay, now, um, this particular assignment here deals with what is known as an experimental design. Um, on the AP exam, um, on the free response, um, every year at least one question out of the five free response questions is an experimental design question, where basically where you have to design an experiment in order to make sense of um, um, some data or some claim that is being made. Um, now normally um, during the school year, um, um, we do experimental design um, actual experimental design situations in class where we actually develop the labs and do the labs here, but obviously we're, you know, you guys are at home right now. Um, but so I'm just going to do my best to explain some of the necessary steps you need to take whenever you're doing any experiment. Okay, so let's read this scenario here. It says a toy company claims to have developed two toy car models, which they call A and B, where the average speed of each car is identical. Um, each group of students is given two toy cars, a meter stick, and a stopwatch, and they are asked to test the toy company's claim. Okay, so this toy company says both these cars roughly have a velocity 
a 0.5 meters per second with a with an error, a possible error of 0 0.02 meters per second. But for the most part, they say that the velocities are the same. Okay, the class wants to be able to test this claim, and they want to design an experiment to test this claim. So part A says that the students decide that they need to collect distance and time data for each car to test the company's claim. The students design a procedure. So the instructions here says cross out any extraneous steps and order the remaining procedure steps. Okay, so these are the various things you have to do, and they're not necessarily ordered. We're going to put them in order here. But first thing we want to do, guys, we want to cross out any unnecessary things that we don't have to say. Um, guys, whenever students are writing down their experimental design um, um, procedures on the AP exam, in the past, the College Board has noticed a habit that students have a uh, um, students frequently say things that you don't need to say, that these things are kind of obvious. So, for example, it's kind of obvious that you have to gather your equipment um, for any lab or any um, procedure that you do. So that's something you really don't have to say. Like in order in order to save you know space on your paper, you really don't have to say that. So we're going to cross it out. It's not necessary to say that. Uh, let me use a better line. So we can cross out where it says gather equipment because it's, it's not necessary to say that because that's kind of obvious. Another thing that you don't have to say, you don't have to say you're going to draw a data table in your notebook um, um, because we know we know that we're going to have to um, write out data. So, you know, you don't have to say that. It's something that you're going to do for every lab. It's, it's, it's kind of obvious there. Um, so these are the two things that, that students have a habit of saying. And so the college board just wants you guys to understand that whenever you're running out your procedures, you don't have to say, well, gather the equipment. It's kind of obvious. They know that. Duh. Uh, but so we're just left with um, these four more procedural steps. So guys, read through this and someone tell me by putting this in order, uh, which, um, which one of these steps represents procedure one. So kind of read through that, guys, and someone tell me. What is the first step you would do in order to figure out the speed of these toy cars? Measure a two-meter long path on the floor. Exactly right. That's the very first step you want to do. Yep. Measure a two-meter long path on the floor. Second step. Turn the car on and release along the measured path. Yes, sir. Third step. Measure and record the time the car took to travel the two meters with the stopwatch. Yep. And lastly, obviously, we want to repeat our steps in order to reduce any error in measurements. So, yep, you're exactly right. Uh, so, um, that's basically the order of, of most procedural designs. You know, you know, you um, measure out, you know, any distance or anything, and obviously you want to tell what you want to do to collect your data, and then you actually go through and you collect your data and then repeat in order to get accurate results. Okay, looking at Part B. Part B says, given is a data set collected by students in the class, based on these data, what conclusions should the students make about, about the, uh, what's the student, what conclusions, what conclusions should the students make about the hypotheses that the two cars, A and B, have the same speeds? Okay, so guys, so in our class, we have six lab groups, okay? And as we can see, so in this case, lab one, um, this is the value of the speed that they got for car A, and this is the value of the speed that they got for car B. Um, and again, the other lab groups, this is the values that they got for their cars, which are listed um, um, below lab one. So now, looking at this data, guys, looking at the class data, what is the best conclusion we can make? Uh, should we conclude that the cars have the same average speed, or should we conclude they have, or, or should we conclude that the cars have different average speeds? Before you guys make up your mind, look closely at the data first before you draw, before you draw your conclusion. 
So what do y'all think? Someone. What do y'all think? Look closely at the data. Do you think it's reasonable to conclude that both cars have the same average speed or they have different speeds? Because remember, the toy, the toy company says they do have the same average speed, but is that what the data says? No. Yeah, you, you, yeah. From the data, um, from, from a reasonable from a reasonable deduction of the data, you can say that the cards have different average speeds. Why? Why can you conclude that? Can someone give me a specific reason, or, um, um, as far as a reasonable understanding of the data that we have here? On average, car B has a natural higher speed. Than car A. Um, yeah, but is that is that from what we're told from the averages here? So there's no. something here that's throwing these that's throwing our values off. I want you guys to notice. The car B slowed down and then sped back up. Yeah, but that's not what's throwing. So so well, okay, uh, okay. Well, let me let me ask you to approach this from another perspective. Okay, guys, look at every group. For the most part, every group's data seems to be consistent except for one group. One group appears to be off. What would y'all say? Huh? Uh, car A had a spike while in group B, I mean, in group five, for car B, it failed. Exactly. L look at group five. Group five, their data appears to be way off compared to the rest of the class. So, guys, it's reasonable to conclude that group five, it's reasonable to conclude that they're an outlier. So, something they did wrong because, for the most part, everybody else, everybody else in the class got, you know, their, you know, you know, you know, the data looked to be roughly consistent, but group five, it was just, it was way, it was way out there. So, group five had to do something wrong. So, group five appears to be the outlier. Um, Guys, if you eliminate this outlier here and you go back and you take the averages of these speeds, you will actually see that car A has a different average speed compared to car B whenever we eliminate the outlier. So, guys, in a, in a physics class or any science class, it is a good habit to always eliminate your outliers. Your outliers are not really important. You want to you want to make you want to draw conclusions from the consistent data points not the outliers. So I'm gonna write this down here because this is something very important for interpreting scientific data. If, if the outliers are removed, so group five is the outliers. So in any experiment, if the outliers are removed, and in this case, the average velocities will not be the same. Yeah, so if we remove the if we remove the outliers, the average velocities will not be the same. So if we remove the outliers, the average velocities will not be the same. Okay. So whenever you're collecting data and you're making sense of data, you want to you want to draw conclusions from general trends in the data. You want to ignore any sort of outliers. Are data that that appears to be um, um, that is obviously erroneous. So, just something to keep in mind. Okay, can I keep going? Y'all got that written down? Okay, so let's look at part C. Part C says, uh, the students decide that additionally they want to test the toy company's claim that the car speed is constant throughout the motion. 
How, if at all, does the experimental procedure from part A need to be modified to verify that the car's instantaneous speed is constant? Okay, so Ansela and Blake both have different ideas how they want to modify their procedures to, to determine if the car speed is constant throughout its motion. So here's what Angela says. Um, we're going to compare their two statements and see who's right and who's, um, 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 well, who who gets, um, who is correct in their procedures in order to make sense of this claim. Um, um, Angela thinks that they should use a motion sensor, sensor to collect speed versus time data. If, this, if the graph of the speed versus time is horizontal with a zero slope, then the instantaneous speed is constant. Okay. Blake thinks that they should use photo gates positioned at the beginning and end of a two meter long track to determine the instantaneous speed of the cart. The students measure the length of the car and divide this length by the time recorded by the photo gate to determine the instantaneous speed. Okay. By the way, I know I know we I know we're not in class right now, so I can't physically show you guys what photo gates are. We actually have some photo gates in the back here. But what a photo gate is, it's a it's a small device that basically allows you to measure the speed of objects um, for for specific intervals of time. Um, and of course, motion detectors um, or a motion sensor, but it basically allows you to plot out a graph of the object's speed um, um, throughout the entire time that it's moving. Again, like I said, if I if y'all were here, I would actually show you what those things are. Um, but for now, I just want to just explain that to you all um, listening from home. So, um, so who is who has the best procedure? In determining how to figure out if the car speed is constant throughout its path of motion. I'm going to tell you guys right now, Angela's the one is correct. Here's why Blake is incorrect. Blake says that we want to use a photo gate to determine um, uh, the speed at both the beginning and the end of the track. However, guys, if we, if we only have data points for the beginning of the track and at the end of the track, how will we know the speed of the object in between those two points? How can we test to see that the object speed stays constant if we don't have any data points um, that we can interpolate in between those two points? So Angela would be correct because by using a motion sensor, she can plot a speed versus time graph um, at various points throughout the entire time that the car is moving. So Angela is the one who is correct here. Again, Blake is wrong is because um, Blake method, using Blake method, you would only know the speed at the beginning and end. Um, so let me go ahead and write that down. So in other words, Blake, uh, Blake would need more than two data points if he wanted to draw the conclusion that the speed stays constant throughout the entire time. So Angela... is correct. Uh, Blake's method Blake's method only gives the beginning and ending velocities. Okay. We would need more than two data points. We would need more than two data points. Basically, we need more than two data points to know if the speed stays constant throughout the course of motion, throughout the entire time the object is in motion. Um, since we only, since Blake, Blake's method only gives us two data points, we, we need to go with Angelus in order to um, to test whether or not this toy car's claim is accurate. All right. 
guys go ahead and finish writing that. Okay, everybody got that? Can I move on? Okay, so I, I assume you guys are all good. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I want to close out the day talking about. So remember, hold on to these assignments. Um, keep them in a folder or a binder somewhere. Um, so I want to close out the day talking about. Um, um, going into more depth with graphing, specifically velocity time graphs. So let me Okay, I'm going to share my screen here um, again. So, guys, um, like I said, throughout the coming days, we're going to elaborate more and more on, on, on understanding trends and graphs. And uh, in this course, there are three major types of graphs we deal with. We deal with position time graphs, velocity time graphs, and acceleration time graphs. And, of course, we're going to focus more on acceleration time graphs um, late next week. Um, we've already talked about position time graphs, and we talked a little bit about velocity time graphs. Um, so real briefly, I just want to go over a few patterns so that people will understand that whenever you're comparing the two, you guys understand which is which. So we've already talked about something like this on a velocity time graph here. If I have a velocity time graph, we already know what's happening there on our velocity time graph. We know this right here, this is an object moving in the negative direction. So it's moving in the negative direction, and of course, it's moving at a constant velocity. Okay. The question is, how do we replicate this exact same scenario on a velocity versus time graph? So guys, velocity time graphs always have a positive end and negative end. The positive end is below the time axis, and the negative end, um, I mean, the well, the positive end is above the time axis, and the negative end is below the time axis. So as you can see, these are all negative values, and these are all positive values. So guys, um, on a position time graph, if I, if I had to draw an object moving at a negative velocity, um, and the velocity stays constant, then I would draw something like this, um, a line basically, uh, um, a a perfectly horizontal line um, that represents the object is velocity is staying constant. So like, let's just say hypothetically, if I took this slope here and I found that this slope was negative four meters per second, then on my velocity time graph, I will come over here and I will plot my, I will put my line at negative four meters per second. And of course the velocity just stays constant as time progresses. But what about this right here, guys? Um, what does this line right here mean? Hold on, let me use another color. What does this line right here mean on a position versus time graph? Constant. Constant what? Just, I don't just say constant. Constant what? Because that's a position versus time graph. So what do you mean by good? Just don't say constant. Tell me what. Give me more. Give me more. So it's staying at a constant position. That is correct in that it's staying at a constant position. What does a constant position mean? It means our object is what? Stop. Yeah, it's at rest. It's not moving. It's stationary. Um, guys, if I'm just sitting here and I'm just staying at this exact same position and I'm not moving, you know, I'm just staying at this position in time, by definition, I am stationary. By definition, my velocity is 
zero. So that means if you want to represent this exact same scenario on a velocity time graph, you always draw it through um, 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 through a velocity of zero here, always. Okay. So and it, it has to go through the axis here because, again, anything that's not moving has zero velocity. So in the velocity time graph, this velocity must always go through the axis here. The velocity must be zero. Okay, the velocity is neither positive nor negative, it's just zero. So just, again, something to think about. Mm -hmm. um, let us do a few more. So comparing some important scenarios. What if I have, what if I have a line, ugh, that's not a good line. What if I have a line that looks like this and another object represented by a line that looks like this? So guys, if I have two objects on my position time graph, can someone tell me which of these objects is moving um, with a greater velocity, the, per the, the object represented by the purple line or the object represented by the green line? The purple line. Yeah, the purple because line, it's because it's steeper, exactly. It has a greater velocity because the slope is steeper. So if you have to represent this exact same scenario on a velocity time graph, it would look something like this. Okay. You would have to make sure that the purple line is higher up than the green line. Again, so both these velocities are constant, but clearly one is moving with a greater velocity. And uh, let us assume hypothetically I can measure the values of this slope here. This will, let's just say this slope will be at eight meters per second and this slope will be at four meters per second. I need to represent that on my velocity time graph. So the object that has the greater velocity, um, um, the line needs to go through the greater number on the velocity time graph to indicate that the velocity is higher. So the velocity stays constant, but clearly the purple line has a greater velocity than the green line. One more thing that I want to say, because we're going to talk more about this next time. Oh, crap. I'm, I just I ran out of graphs. Uh, let me just delete this. Right. So, um, guys, um, we know how something that's moving at a constant velocity looks like on a velocity time graph. But what about something that's accelerating, something that's speeding up? If an object is speeding up on a velocity versus time graph, so specifically, let's say it's speeding up in the positive direction, then the, our velocity time, I'm sorry, not our velocity time graph, but our position versus time graph, our position versus time graph will look something like this. So we would have a curved line. So everybody see that? So for something that's moving at a constant velocity on a position time graph, you know, it's a straight line, but if it's accelerating, the line is going to curve. So this represents something speeding up, specifically speeding up in the positive direction. And if I wanted to replicate this exact same scenario on a velocity versus time graph, my velocity time graph looks something like this. So both these scenarios means that my object is speeding up. But in this case, this is what it looks like on a position time graph. And this is what it looks like on a velocity time graph. So right, as time progresses, this the velocity gets greater and greater and greater. And we're going to talk more about this next time as we analyze these trends even more. I just wanted to introduce that to you guys. That anytime something is speeding up or accelerating, you're going to have a curved line um, on a position versus time graph. Any questions? Okay. Um, before I let you guys go, um, I'm going to say this. There's going to be two assignments posted today um, in Schoology. Um, the first assignment is just a five-question um, um, five multiple-choice assignment. And the second assignment is an Ed Puzzle video, and it's just like five minutes. So, you know, um, two assignments may sound like a not. It may sound like a lot, but it's really is not. Um, it, and I think it's pretty reasonable. Um, I'm going to also give an assignment to you guys tomorrow, so be sure you're looking out for that. 
um, because remember on Fridays your assignment not only does it count for your grade it also counts for your attendance okay um, so if y'all don't have any immediate questions for me at the moment you are free to go and I hope you guys have a great weekend